Okay, the joy of arid landscapes, uh, part one. Uh, this one's going to be about the processes. A bit of science in here, uh, some slides with a lot of words on it, a bit of an example. So do go back, pause it, have a review of it. I'll try and take it as slowly as possible. Okay, first things first. So desert geomorphology, the shaping of a land in arid areas. Um, obviously, the climate drives the processes of weathering and erosion. And in particular, if we're thinking about deserts, the big characteristics to consider are, of course, the temperature regimes. So we have a very, very high diurnal temperature range. So we're going to be going up to 35 plus degrees in many areas. Bear in mind, we're talking very generally here. Arid environments do vary a lot from the very, very, very hyper arid areas, such as the center of the Atacama, all the way through to the slightly more moist semi-arid areas of the Badlands of the United States. And in amongst there, you're going to get regional differences because of topography, closeness to the oceans, etc., etc. But anyway, high diurnal temperature range, up above 35 degrees in most places, and certainly the one time I've stayed in a desert for any long period of time, it got down below freezing at night. So you've got about 35 plus diurnal temperature range. That's going to have a big impact on the forces at work on the rocks. Uh, in addition, of course, that's also going to lead to a large amount of desiccation high evaporation rates, potential evaporation rates, at any rate if there was water there, going to have a very pronounced effect as we'll see in particular with salt weathering. And then we need to consider the forces of erosion, the dark forces of erosion. They are of course fluvial in terms of very heavy, high magnitude but low frequency storm events, very intense events, cutting to obvious features like wadis due to should surface sheet flow. But you've also got very large aeolian forces, uh, wind speeds very, very high because there isn't much vegetation to act as a, as a friction barrier, so wind speeds again stay high. So the high tidal temperature range and the, uh, the high evaporation rates will determine the types of weathering processes, whether they're mechanical, physical processes, or chemical processes. Kind of excluding biological weathering, because biological weathering usually means exhibiting a physical force, like roots breaking up rocks as they penetrate through them, that's a physical force of weathering, or they exaggerate chemical impacts. So for example, chelation agents, and chelation agents are organic acids that can really do some damage rotting rocks, some quite strong rocks as well. And then we won't really talk much about erosion, that's gonna be when we come on to the part two, and we'll talk about the landforms themselves. We're really gonna look at the weakening of the rock, Obviously, that will then lead to screes and mass movement, and this parts four and five will be for a later point, uh, giving us our final ideas before the landforms of deposition. So from the climate, we get the weathering and the erosion processes. We're going to look at this area up here. Then we'll move on to mass movement to do with erosion and deposition, giving us our landforms. Okay, so the basics, the weathering processes. Okay, two types of weathering, as you probably know, mechanical weathering and physical weathering. Uh, mechanical weathering, physical weathering, mechanical weathering and chemical weathering. All weathering processes, and I love this jargon, are essentially exogenic forces acting on endogenic non-conformities. What does that mean? Well, the exogenic forces are the forces of the climate. They're exogenic, they're outside of the rock. The endogenic nonconformities relate to the weaknesses and structures within the rock that might allow different types of weathering to take advantage of them. Exogenic forces versus endogenic nonconformities. And essentially, of course, the forces acting on the landscape versus the weaknesses inherent in the rock. These two bits of red, I think, are really worth remembering because many often you'll get questions that will want you to talk about more than one process. But hopefully I'm going to give you enough detail here to go through these various processes. So there are the processes of physical weathering or mechanical weathering, granular disintegration, very, very small scale leading to a rotting of the rock, block separation come up in scale now, and you get larger blocks breaking off, again related both to the diurnal temperature range in particular, shattering, which is related to very rapid diurnal temperature fluctuations, where in fact the exogenic forces can change so rapidly that the rock cannot respond and shatters. And hidden within there, you've still got a bit of frost shattering. I did mention earlier that sometimes deserts get very, very cold at night, and you will get ice crystal growth, which can lead to congelifraction, lovely phrase. And then you've got slip up from those, exfoliation, where you get uh, peeling off of layers of rock, and that clearly is something to do with the um, heating from the outside of the rock, penetrating down through the rock, so that if you go from any point on the rock surface, you should find that if you go down an equal depth, you should find the temperature has increased about the same. So your rates of expansion alter with parallel to the surface of the rock. A bit more on that in a moment. And there's also something called pressure release. 
A lot of the rocks in deserts, of course, have been exposed by the erosion of the material above them, and that means that they may have been created, uh, they may have been intruded, um, they may have been uh, laid down with a greater mass weighing down them, so that now when that mass has relatively quickly been weathered off them by aeolian forces or by fluvial forces, suddenly the rock finds itself with less pressure pushing down and it wants to expand a bit. And that can be enough to lead to tiny little fissures being created in the upper surfaces of the rock, which can be exploited by diurnal temperature ranges. And finally, slaking. Slaking is the swelling that occurs when a rock mineral absorbs water. It's very similar to hydration we see down here in chemical weathering. First thing to say, Chemical weathering, of course, relies on a solvent. And even though there's very little moisture in deserts, there is enough for chemical weathering to occur. Obviously, the more moisture you get, the greater the chance of having enough solvent to be able to be active in all five of these processes. However, even with the dew of the morning, which you may have seen David Attenborough videos of lizards licking the dew off rocks and things like that, that's enough for many of these processes to take place. Okay, on we go. This could get heavy. There's a nice little bit of spalling or exfoliation for you. You can see the parallel plate depth breaking off. And here we've got a beautiful landscape. We've got some granite in front of us. That's actually a geological hammer. And you've got rock fragments, a typical sort of uh, arid environment, two different features which we'll talk about. First, granular disintegration. When you've got different colored minerals in a rock, what we call a polycrystalline rock, like granite, and you can see there's a bit of uh, out of focus granite for you here, made up of typically three minerals. Feldspar, which is a browny colour, mica, which can be brown and your blacky colour, and quartz, which is of course translucent or white. Very simply put, under the heat of the day, those minerals, because of their colours, absorb different amounts of heat energy and are liable to therefore want to expand because of that heating during the day um, at different rates, which means that at the granular level you're going to get weaknesses upon which the wind or water droplets may act, and you're going to get composition of different kinds of action going on, but at a very, very small scale, and scale is a great way of trying to bring these weathering processes together, granular disintegration is a cracker. It works on polycrystalline rocks, so typically those can be very strong, massive rocks such as granite, and it's nice to be able to talk about an endogenic weakness within the granite, which is able to be taken advantage of by the diurnal temperature range to give you granular disintegration. Very small scale, you can see some rotting, it's often called rotting, and you can have a look at the objects in here. Here's a, a, another object at, at slightly different scale, you can see here a little bit of salts. And what I'm trying to show here is that there is a mix of weathering processes happening at once. Very rare to find just one weathering process happening, and it's really good to be able to identify them, and then possibly link them up as well. So here we can just see the, the fluorescence of salts. Okay. Sorry, I mentioned that already. So here, the second one, exfoliation or pressure release. Notice I'm not doing it in the right order because that would have been really cool and, and not that good. These platelets come off because the heating occurs from the surface inwards. You get the expansion outwards. Of course, then a cooling at night. You get a contraction inwards and outwards. And it's the outer layers that are doing the expanding and the contracting, the expanding and the contracting, expanding and the contracting, the expanding and the contractor. So it's the outer layers that are having to undergo more deformation. Of course, rock isn't a plastic. Otherwise, it wouldn't hurt if somebody threw it at you. <clears throat> As it can't deform plastically, it then shatters. Microscale giving you fissures, which again, water can get into, and there may be enough to give you the breakup. And you can see that small scale, there's your geological hammer, much larger scale here getting towards uh, granite disintegration. Now, this is a pressure release dome. This looks like it might have been some kind of intrusion, which has now been exposed, and therefore now we've got a lot of pressure release, and the upper surface also wants to expand and fill its gap available to it. Okay, dropping down a scale now. We have shattering. You can see from the angularity of the debris and the massive falling apart here. That has not been scythed down by Clayface, if you know your uh, Batman Arkham City. That is a clear set of real angular features. What happens with shattering is if you get a very pronounced diurnal temperature range and it, it may have reached a, a fatigue level. Fatigue means the same um, expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction has gone on a long time. However, it might just be that that weakening of the rock along uh, lines of weakness, be they small with individual particles here, or possibly some kind of bedding plane, you can make out parallel lines in here. It might just be that just one big dial change led to a catastrophic failure rather than a small scale. 
in amongst there, I put in the, the fact that you can also get the action of ice crystal growth in the usual way. Block separation. You can see this landscape, beautiful landscape from Maine, and you can see this landscape uh, from Gila Bend in Arizona. If you've got bedding planes and joints, so we're going to be talking more about a sedimentary rock now, nice to tie a particular rock type to a type of uh, feature of weathering if you can. If you're going to get bedding planes and joints, remember bedding planes are horizontal, joints are vertical, then what you might end up with are large blocks, really well shown up here, coming away where you've in fact had expansion and contraction and a, a, not a weakness at a granular level but a weakness along the lines of weakness joints where the rock has expanded bedding planes where they're naturally weak and you can see here an idealized idea of course these babies will then slip down the slope and will fall some kind of screen you can see a couple down here in the Arizona picture um move me up Note the significance of the bedding planes, as I said, endogenic non-conformities. Lovely. I'm going to have everybody using that term from now on. On to chemical weathering, and I'll try and be as straightforward as possible. You'll need to pause me because there's a lot of wordage on here, mainly to make sure I've got everything covered. First one, salt crystal growth. Clearly, water warmed up in a desert is going to dissolve salts. That means that the water is going to be very, very saline, salty. The H2O evaporates off, leaving you with salt crystal growth. And you can go and play with a, a, your, your in your kitchen, go and take a glass or go and take a, a saucer, put some water in, throw some salt in until there's no more salt that can dissolve, put it in your airing cupboard and watch the salt crystals grow. Such fun. Anyway, <coughs> I had a problem with this because the way salt crystals grow is in fact they, they grow outwards by accreting layer and layer. So just the growth of the salt crystal cannot possibly actually exert the force on a rock. So in fact, the key to these babies is the fact that they expand and contract differently on heating. Okay, so you need to have the chemistry to get the salt crystal to grow, but then you need to rely on it to accelerate local weathering by expanding and contracting. Have a look at it, got an interesting one. The landscape that's created by this is known as haloclasty. And here's some from Death Valley. You can see really small fragments, and the rock has lost its its larger mass. Okay, and the very small fragments are typical because the salt process happens at very very small scales, a bit like a bit like granite disintegration. Over here, very very famous honeycomb weathering, and these pits are believed to be caused by accelerated salt crystal growth. This one from the Negev Desert. Hydration. Now, hydration is the quasi chemical process. This is where a whole water molecule is bonded into the rock mineral and in so doing makes the rock mineral expand in size and of course in expanding its size it's going to exert a pressure on the minerals around it again leading to micro fissures and potentially a collapse of the rock matrix all the notes you need are up there can i draw your attention all you ever need to know gypsum and hydrate and hydrate add water becomes gypsum and there's your chemical formulae okay Nice one because this, of course, shows a link between the physical and the chemical processes. Much more obvious as a chemical process is solution. Solution, of course, is where you get water dissolving minerals. Bear in mind that we've got a very hot environment, so your water is warm. And you know from your bunts and burners heating up your chemistry experiments that if we apply activation energy and ours comes from the sun, then this can be very, very effective if you've got enough water around, of course. Okay, particularly effective on your carbonates, your sedimentary rocks, your limestones, and also into your sandstones and alike. A couple of shots of landscape. This is known as the Devil's Golf Balls, uh, or Devil's Golf Course, sorry. This is the pronounced effect of solution producing a halite, which is a rock very, very rich in chloride. And you can see a very, very strange, almost looks like a, a, a lava flow. But this shows how the rotting, sorry, it shows the impact of the rotting that could, and it's that very alkaline environment of the, the desert. Uh, nearly finished, hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is the simple process where the hydrogen ion, now the hydrogen ion is the Napoleon of chemistry. He's Napoleon because he's tiny and very powerful. And what the hydrogen ion is able to do, coming out of water, of course, is to get in and break up chemical bonds really, really easily. Particularly good for rotting um, igneous rocks, particularly good at breaking down feldspar to uh, then clays, which can be, sorry, the feldspar, which to a clay such as kaolinite, which can then be easily washed away or blown away sometimes if it then desiccates. Hydrolysis, but again, you need your water. And then ultimately, oxidation rusting. And oxidation gives you a, a lot of landscapes in deserts um, their ready colour. 
And the reason for this is because, of course, there's a, a large exposure of, of water in terms of the morning time when that very cold rock, because of the very cold night, has got a layer of dew forming on it. And of course, that helps to oxidize the rocks. There's an example from the Colorado River Valley. You can see the oxidation. And here you can see a veneer, uh, a, a varnish, as it's called, a desert varnish on a vertical slope. You know, quite clear coloration. OK. This is an amazing depression formed out in Egypt. And this is known as the Qatar Depression. Interestingly, this big depression, how big? Well, it's number three here. That big, we believe, is mainly caused by salt weathering. So a very small process when magnified because of the local groundwater being very, very, very uh, alkaline can cause a very large scale feature. So we started from the very small granular disintegration, mineral on mineral, and we've come up to showing how a process can dominate an area. Load of notes for you about this. Why do this? Why give you this one to stand out? I just think it's quite nice to be able to have this located detail. So for example, you've got your location, you've got your names of your disintegration that's going on um, and I would just sit down and learn it. If I dip myself out of here so you can only see the top of my head, there you go, there's an egg at the bottom there. You've got enough here to pause me and go and learn. Um, if you put in the Qatar depression you'll find that it's a nice little case to be for you. Okay, summation. Three things to remember. Firstly, because there isn't that much water, rates of weathering can be very slow. However, there are um, diurnal fatigue processes going on every single day. So actually, though chemical weathering may not be that important in terms of, of, of a very pacey form of weathering, actually what is going on is a large amount of heating, cooling, heating, cooling, heating, cooling, heating, cooling, heating, cooling, etc. You get the idea. And therefore, those fatigue processes, rather like bending a ruler, expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, oh, it's broken, are very, very significant. Of course, they will give us lots of angular debris. Secondly, you must know by now that you cannot have weathering, even physical weathering, without the presence of water. And the good news is that even though there is a, a very low absolute humidity in the clouds in desert areas, there's enough humidity so that when the rock gets very cold at night, that moisture does give you enough, um, so that moisture in the air does give you enough condensation onto the rock to allow mechanical processes to take place. The dew, in other words, is very important. And finally, obviously, remember different types of weathering will happen simultaneously. So we go back to the idea of endogenic nonconformities, weaknesses in the rock, being by exogenic forces, dynal temperature range, and the presence of water in small amounts. Then we'll talk about erosion and what happens with the debris that comes from here. Um, but for now, that's where we are, and that will take us through these areas. And next time, I'll go through the landscape features. More slides, fewer words. I thank you.